Hello. My apologies if my voice sounds a bit cracked. I have been in the Ghana game. <laughs> and welcome to our last webinar in our World Antimicrobial Awareness Week 2022 series of webinars. Today we are looking at how healthcare professionals can collaborate in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Thank you all so much for joining us today. World Antimicrobial Awareness Week is commemorated each year from 18th to 24th November. The theme this year, preventing antimicrobial resistance together, shows, indeed recognizes the role that we all have to play if we are to prevent antimicrobial resistance. At the Ghana College of Pharmacists, we are in full agreement with this theme. Indeed, we hold the position that engagement and collaboration are critical if we will be able to provide health services effectively and improve patient outcomes. We therefore regularly engage various collaborators and partners in our quest to improve the delivery of pharmaceutical care and services. For us, the fight against antimicrobial resistance is no different. Indeed, in the face of this battle for our lives, collaboration among healthcare providers is needed now more than ever. That is why we have put together this panel of experts to discuss with us, all of us, healthcare pro providers, how we can collaborate in our quest to prevent antimicrobial resistance together. Today, we have with us, and I am sure all of us joining this um, meeting will be familiar with these names. Dr. George Ambufa, Dr. William Addo Mills Papu, Mrs. Philomena Wule, and pharmacist Israel Abebre Sesefa. These experts are going to discuss with us various perspectives and bring out the important um, lessons that we are to learn and how we can collaborate together to ensure that we, we win this battle. So take your notes, take your pens and your sheets of paper, capture notes as we go on and note down your questions. There'll be the opportunity to discuss with all of us our ideas on how we can collaborate as healthcare professionals. And with that, I'll say a big thank you again for joining us. And I will hand over to our moderator for the day, Dr. Augustina Kudia. Please take over. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Madam Rector, for the opening remarks. So for us to save time, I'm going to just do a brief introduction for our next speaker. So this is pharmacist, Dr. Israel um, Sefa. He's a lecturer and a specialist pharmacist with key interest in antimicrobial resistance stewardships, um, infectious disease. He has vast experience and he is currently the head of the Department of Pharmacy in Keta Municipal Hospital. We want to invite him to tell us from his perspective as a specialist pharmacist, what can we do as health professionals collaborating together to win the fight against antimicrobial resistance? So over to you. If you are ready, Farm Dr. Sefa. Okay. So whilst we wait for him to log on, I want to tell you a bit more about the fight against antimicrobial resistance from Ghana. So I'm sure we are all aware in this week uh, the theme is to preventing antimicrobial resistance working together. 
And in country, we have the antimicrobial resistance policy, and we also have an action plan that allows us to implement the policy as um, stated. The policy has five main objectives. So the first, of course, is to improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance. And of course, as already said by Madam Rector, and this is one of these um, activities. Okay, so pharmacist, Dr. Sefa is here. So I'm going to hand over to him. Over to you. Thank you very much, Augustina. You're welcome. Yeah, my name is Israel and I'm here to share with you uh, my experience with um, antimicrobial stewardship. As Augustina mentioned, antimicrobial stewardship is one of the uh, main activities or objectives of the National Action Plan towards combating antimicrobial resistance. I was fortunate um, to be part of um, a, a project that went on between Keta Municipal Hospital, Ghana Police Hospital, and some um, UK institutions. In 2019, um, this collaboration won um, a fund of about 29,000 pounds and we designed a project to establish antimicrobial stewardship in these two hospitals. We were supported by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and we had some representatives from um, Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group and the University of Manchester. Um, so the project was designed mainly to establish antimicrobial stewardship with the assistance of the Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And they came up with what they call a Scottish triad model to establish antimicrobial stewardship in a health facility. This model required the need for information, education, and quality improvement. So they set out to inform and make made up, um, all the staffs and those who are going to be part of the project aware of what the whole thing is about so that they can get the leadership um, commitment and buy-in. Afterwards, um, a team, a core team was established, an antimicrobial stewardship team, which worked as a subcommittee of the Drug and Therapeutic Committee um, established already in the hospital. After the training, the, tr the training of the core team members, they developed a tool to evaluate the um, knowledge gained. Um, so they were able to assess the knowledge before the training and then the knowledge after and afterward they saw that there was a big difference in terms of knowledge that had been gained and um, this evaluation was published in one of um, the journals which i may show you later um, after the training of the core team members which comprise of a pharmacist um, a medical doctor a nurse a microbiologist an infection prevention nurse and one administrative staff um, the team were equipped to be able to undertake the first point prevalence survey using the global point prevalence survey tool. Afterwards, the team were also equipped with the skill to train um, other clinical staff on the AMS principles. The team were able to train about 100 clinical staff. Um, the essence is so that when there is, when we start implementing some of the interventions, we would not have resistance in the hospital because everybody would be aware of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, so that the, after the point, first point prevalence survey, um, we were able to identify what we call quality gaps. And one of the important quality gaps that we identified was guideline compliance. So we saw that among the various gaps, um, generally almost about 90% of the infectious disease that were managed with antimicrobials were managed empirically um, without any um, testing um, culture and sensitivity. And therefore, if there is empirical management, then it must be based on guideline compliance. But a greater number of the prescriptions were not complying with guideline. So we set out that to improve on antimicrobial use, let's identify this particular gap and see how we can um, encourage antimicrobial stewardship. So we identified pneumonia management at the OPD 
as one of the commonest infectious disease that is managed and therefore we set out to see how we can improve guideline compliance um so there was on on a weekly basis um, gal, um guideline compliance were assessed for all pneumonia management and the, we use paper-based assessment to collect all the data over a period of about 30 weeks um, which was at different stages we employed the quality improvement um, methodology or tool to see how we can improve and, and see whether there has been a change um, in behavior and also in our findings this um, project was also later published in a peer review journal um, then later on we also identified that um, dental condition management also is um, associated with a lot of antibiotics especially at the ambulatory level and therefore a, another study was undertaken to understand from the prescriber's point of view and also the dispenser's point of view um, on the uh, on the use of antibiotics this was a qualitative study that um, was later analyzed and currently we are working towards publishing this and one important thing that has helped in the success of antimicrobial stewardship in um, the two hospitals ghana police hospital and keta municipal hospital is um, the, the the fact that the pharmacists and especially the core team members were made um, antimicrobial stewardship champions to keep on encouraging all other staffs to um, be interested in appropriate use of antibiotics and um, with the help of the, our partners with healthcare improvement scotland and so on um, we were able to achieve one important thing they did was they took one staff from the hospital and another staff from ghana police hospital to scotland to go and have some kind of practical experience and that also helped to really understand how to fully implement antimicrobial stewardship one important lesson that was learned during this trip was the need to have something like a weekly um, audit where the team take probably a day and then undertake antibiotic audit. And then during the audit, whatever findings that are unraveled are shared with the rest of the clinical team in different formats in the form of clinical meetings and so on. This helped, especially during the pneumonia project, helped in improving guideline compliance. This were encountered during the project. And one important challenge was the high attrition rate of prescribers. Um, and this did not help. But one intervention that was used to overcome this particular um, challenge was the fact that at the pharmacy department, any new prescriber who enters in is um, has to have some interaction with the head of pharmacy or a team of pharmacists who would brief them of the antimicrobial stewardship requirements and some important indicators so that before they even start prescribing they are aware of some of the do's and don'ts and so that it will not be a challenge later on when we have to um, discuss some of these issues with them another important challenge was the sustainability especially after 2019 when COVID came um, and the fund was dwindling we needed to sustain the project but um, the sustainability of this project especially continuous surveillance conducting almost every six months point prevalence survey and undertaking um, prospective audit and then feedback to the clinician became a challenge and uh, we are hoping to improve upon this as we are applying for fund to ensure sustainability of the program so these are some of the things that i want to share with you on how antimicrobial stewardship can be held or can um can be done in in a government hospital or in a public health facility thank you very much Thank you so much, um, Sefa, for your presentation. Um, I really like the narration of the teamwork uh, towards the research, collecting information, the publication. You also talked about the weekly audits. 
And I'm sure these are some examples that others can also pick and implement within their facilities. So there will be more questions as we go along. We'll take another um, presentation from our next facilitator, and this is uh, Dr. George Amofa. Dr. George Amofa is a public health physician with several years of experience within the health sector. Um, he is the PARS Deputy Director, Ghana Health Service from 2007 to 2011. He's currently Technical Advisor to PATH Access Accelerated NCD Projects and the President of the Public Health Association of Ghana. Dr. Mofa, if you are ready, if you can tell us um, a little about collaboration, how do we collaborate um, as health professionals to fight antimicrobial resistance from the perspective of a medical doctor. Over to you, Dr. Mofa. Yes, uh, th th thank you very much. I hope you can he he hear me and uh, th thank you for the opportunity to, to also be a facilitator uh, today. Uh, I, I'll just indicate that my experience, personal experience uh, with uh, antimicrobial resistance actually dates back uh, as far back as the early 1980s when uh, I actually lost a, a patient I mean, who uh, appeared to have had septicemia uh, at that time and we used almost all the common uh, antibiotics and it was a very painful uh, experience which really has guided me uh, in, to become interested in antimicrobial surveillance systems. Uh, but, but I was able to consolidate that uh, in, in terms of collaborating with other stakeholders to implement an uh, antimicrobial surveillance system. It's just similar to what had just been uh, presented in, uh, from 2019 uh, at Lekma uh, Hospital. Uh, where a partnership between the Ghana Public Health Association, uh, UK Faculty of Public Health, and re related UK institutions uh, came together to develop uh, a proposal for establishing an AMS uh, system in, in Legma Hospital initially, and then it was extended uh, to Legma Polyclinic, uh, where b b basically uh, be, be between the doctors, public health uh, practitioners, uh, infection prevention control officers, uh, pharmacies, laboratory uh, officers, and other stakeholders, we, we basically came together to uh, uh, develop and uh, execute the, 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 this uh, AMS system. And it's not too different from what I've been uh, said. I mean, there, there were training, uh, joint training sessions on what uh, constitutes AMS uh, with a little focus on infection prevention and control. We added uh, the gender uh, equality and social inclusion uh, components uh, to that. We de developed uh, manuals on the use of uh, antibiotics be based on the uh, treatment guidelines uh, and then uh, established laboratory surveillance of uh, common antibiotics for urine and blood cultures and so that we now uh, have the pattern uh, of sensitivity and resistance for uh, the penicillins, tetracyclines, sporulins, quinolins, uh, and almost all the uh, 12 or 13 common uh, 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 antimicrobials used for urine uh, cultures and the, and also blood uh, cultures and the, and and it goes to confirm the concern that that, that there is increasing resistance to uh, almost all the uh, old and new uh, ones at times as far uh, as much as fifty percent uh, plus uh, re 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 resistance uh, that the, the, that's in addition, also led us to uh, undertake a, a, a antibiotic prescription auditing uh, at the OPD, where uh, a team of pharmacists uh, will, let's say, in a week, uh, audit all the prescriptions that have been uh, pre 
prescribed by pre -pre prescribers, the, the doctors, uh, uh, um, medical uh, uh, assistants, and, and and the like. And and there have been uh, a, a consistent in, in improvement in 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 the pattern of uh, pr practice. I mean, from almost about fifteen percent diagnosis. Uh, co 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 compliance in 19, 2019 to almost about 70 plus a uh, percentage point they, 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 this year. Uh, that, uh, the, this has been complemented by um, joint ward rounds be, between pharmacies, laboratory uh, staff, uh, nurses, and uh, uh, prescribers uh, in, on, on for was those medical ward, surgical ward, uh, obs and gynae ward, and, and that, and, and and it's a regular uh, pattern that that has been established uh, at the um, hospital, especially like my hospital. We, we've extended our uh, tentacles to the community pharmacies around the uh, neighborhood, and and we've been able to map about twenty five of such. Uh, pharmacies and, and brought them uh, on board uh, as part of the partnership and collaboration because we recognize the importance of each of the players. We've also established what we call the delayed prescription for upper respiratory tract infection, recognizing that most upper respiratory tract infections are viral, and yet the common practice has been uh, the pre use of antibiotics uh, for, for, for children. Uh, under five and, and the experience i uh, have been extremely positive it has actually now been institutionalized uh, in, in the hospital uh, and it has also been published uh, in the peer review journals and so these, these are some of the uh, experiences that we have uh, go, 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 gone through no, knowing that one particular team cannot uh, effectively address the, the increasing concern of uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, in the in the country and and so together we 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 hope that we will continue uh, extending our tentacles to the community and other uh, stakeholders around over for for now Dr. Kodria, please, your microphone is off. You are muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you to Apologies. So I'll go back. So thank you again, Dr. Amofa, for um, sharing with us your personal experience also, and then some of the activities that you have undertaken, not only um, um, but also with other um, stakeholders, as you mentioned. And i particularly uh, very impressed with the delayed prescription that you talked about for upper respiratory diseases. Um, our next presenter, um, I'm not sure if she's around. Um, so this is uh, Mrs. Philomena Woolley. She is a nurse midwife with over 30 years experience with the Ghana Health Service. Oh, lovely. Uh, Ministry of Health, good to see you. And with interest in antimicrobial resistance stewardship, is currently the acting registrar for Nursing and Nutrition Council. Uh, Madam, the same question, if you can tell us a little about your experience in collaborating with other health professionals in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. I would say that as nurses and midwives, we are the largest health workforce in the health sector, constituting over 50% of the health workforce. 
And as nurses and midwives, we also stay at the ward 24 seven. And so when these cases come, we see them most, we stay with them and we do everything with them. So it is a very worrying situation as I can say now. And for our role as nurses and midwives, our main role that we have been doing is the promotion and practice of standard prevention precautions. And in this, I would want us to look at the environment, personal hygiene, medical equipment, medical devices, and the nursing care that we give. One, for, our, for the personal hygiene, we usually look at the patient itself, herself or himself, making sure that the bed, the, the patient herself or himself is clean so that the patient will not transfer any infection to the other patient. We also look at the devices that usually some of the patients have, something like the urinary catheter, ventilators, central line, if any, and colostomy bag. And many a times, these are the patients that use antibiotics most. And so we make sure that when we have such patients, we take good care of them. We make sure that cleanliness is one of our paramount things or activity or care that we do so that patients will not transfer their infections to the other patients. And we all know that one thing that is very important in our universal standard prevention is hand washing. And so for moving from patient to patient, we also need to wash our hands and even wash the hands of the patient if any. And these are some of the things that we do. Very important is recognition of signs and symptoms of infection. Patients come to the ward and we do our vital signs. The most important thing is to be quick about recognizing infection. We know that if the temperature is high, it means that someone is getting infection and we report appropriately. And these would let the doctor, you are let the doctor so that the doctor will know that infection is, is, is in place, is taking place on this patient so that prompt recognition and treatment is done. Again, as nurses and midwives, we do patients and patient education, not only at the hospitals, but at the community, in churches, wherever we find ourselves, to combat these antimicrobials. I remember when we were young, when you have a sore, your grandmother will ask you to go and buy ampicillin to put it in the sore. And these and many other things is what has spread the antimicrobial, that is causing the antimicrobial resistance. We also, as nurses and midwives, look at ensuring that collection of specimen is done timely and the transportation is also done well so that we don't keep it too much to bring a different my to, to for, for it to even grow to a extent that it would be difficult for you to send it to the lab and get the good results. Apart from that, medication is very important. We realize that sometimes when medication is given, a patient, if you don't take care and if you don't supervise well, they will not take the medication as it's supposed to be. For instance, doctors will write maybe two, three times daily for five days. If you don't take care, patients will take it for two, three, two, three times for maybe two days. When they realize that the symptoms are low, then they stop. So education is very key when it gets to the role that the nurse play in this um, fighting against 
antimicrobial. Especially, we also looked at good practices when it comes to infection prevention. How do we look at the nursing care? The, how do we bath our patients? Even the medication, how do we go about it? Do we just take the medication without washing our hands? Do we just give it to them without taking care of the patient, making sure that the patient take it at the right time and the duration and all that. And then washing of our hands. We take make sure that these are very key in our treatment of patients when it comes to prevention of these antimicrobials. These are some of the things that we do. Apart from this too, we also look at the bigger pro problem and then we collaborate with our team members. Education, education, education. So wherever we find ourselves, from the beginning when the patient comes in, we educate the patient that you do, do not need to take the medication if you haven't been, if it has not been prescribed to you. And then we also look at other things like the, the, the doctors that we've, we, we work with. Sometimes we even ask them to wash their hands when they perform certain procedures. And these are very key when it comes to nursing care. I think that I am done. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Molly, for all that you have said. And uh, I'm really um, happy that you mentioned the collection of specimen and making sure that it is sent in a timely manner uh, to the lab for testing. And this is interesting because our next facilitator is Dr. William Adomios Apo. He's a renowned medical lab scientist and currently the chief biomedical scientist with the Ghana Health Service. He is a foundation member of the West Africa Postgraduate College of Medical Laboratory Science and a member of the National Antimicrobial Resistance Platform. Um, so the same um, question, um, Dr. Ado Williams. In your role as a biomedical scientist, how can we all health professionals collaborate uh, in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? Over to you, uh, Dr. Ado Mills. Okay, so first of all, you are here. Yes. Oh, please. please. I, uh, yes. I can hear you. Please go ahead with your submission. Okay, Thank so you. I, I will talk about the role of the yes. laboratory in uh, antimicrobial uh, work. So to overcome, we will all know and bear witness with me that the laboratory is very crucial when it comes to antimicrobial testing. Mm -hmm. The laboratory is the place where we actually get to know what is happening to the, what organism is causing uh, the disease. So to overcome antimicrobial resistance, Laboratory testing is one of the keys usually considered helpful in guiding antimicrobial BR therapy. Mm -hmm. So these include antimicrobial agent susceptibility tests, then determination of microbial production of specific resistance, mm -hmm. then testing of specific antimicrobial levels in a serum and other body fluids. So the antimicrobial levels can be tested in serum 
or other body fluids. Then a meaningful communication of the results to the physician or the clinician is very crucial. Uh, increased knowledge through surveillance of emerging resistant mechanisms and trends, also very, very crucial. So every now and then, we have to find out what new mechanism, what new testing methods, what new knowledge is coming out so far as testing of uh, our microbial agents are concerned. So it's very important. Uh, then improve capacity of laboratory to produce accurate and reliable susceptibility testing data. So the laboratory capacity will need to be improved so that uh, we can be able to give reliable susceptibility testing data. Uh, of course, we need to work with health information officers, people who are well versed in IT, so that we'll be able to get the right data and store it as such and use it as such uh, for the purpose. Of course, the laboratory also undergo research and development. So as we do the laboratory testing, we also uh, have to do research. On this note, uh, let me inform us all that if it comes to Ghana, we have different categories of laboratories. Uh, we do testing. Uh, we have, first of all, our research laboratories. And uh, we know we have Noguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research. We have the research laboratories in Ghana Health Service, the Kintampo Health Research Center. We have the KICC. We have the uh, Navrongo uh, Research Center. We have the Dodowa Research Center. So the Dodowa, the Kintampo, and the Navrongo are Ghana Health Service. Then we have the uh, KRCC and then uh, the Noguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research. So this uh, research centers also play very important roles. Uh, and you can all bear witness with me that when the COVID started, by then, uh, Ghana Health Service, uh, levels of laboratories, uh, when it started, WHO uh, came out that we have to use a level three lab, biosafety level three lab. And uh, you can bear witness with me that uh, in Ghana Health Service, we actually have none uh, level three labs, as are then. So we started collaborating with even the veterinary directorate of Accra, uh, Tamale, uh, that's Pont Tamale, then the Takradi uh, laboratory, uh, veterinary laboratory, we collaborated with them. But later, WHO came out that we, we can work in the level two laboratory, biosafety level two laboratory. So uh, most of our labs uh, started doing the COVID. And then later we started using the gene expert uh, machines also for the COVID. And then of course the PCR, polymerase chain reaction uh, testing. So we started using that. So we have different categories of laboratories, I would say. We have the, when we come to the national level, we have the uh, teaching hospital laboratories. Now we even have a quaternary, uh, the Lego Medical Center. Then we have the teaching hospital laboratories. Uh, of course, you all know we have five main teaching hospitals, uh, Kolebu, uh, Confranoche, uh, Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, and the other teaching hospitals, they all play very ro uh, big roles. Then when you come to uh, the Ghana Air Service, we have our regional labs. So all the regions, now let's say all the 16 regions, by then 10 regions, but now we have 16 regions and they all do laboratory investigations in the regional lab. They do, of course, do culture and susceptibility testing. And then we, we come down to our district hospitals. Now we have challenges with our district hospitals uh, doing culture and susceptibility testing. So recently, this week, we were, uh, we were at uh, Mensvik Hotel, working on uh, ICD, Institutional Care Division Retreat. And one of the 
uh, indicators which we want to be we want to be used in the holistic assessment tool is that uh, all uh, these hospital laboratories should be able to do culture and sustainability testing. That means that we have to build capacity at that level also, so that they will be able to do culture and sensitivity testing. Uh, I'll go ahead to mention the national and global AMR monitoring program. So uh, laboratory also helps very well in the national and global antimicrobial resistant monitoring program. Then the, also helps in the determinations or the percentage of times an organism was found susceptible to an antibiotic in a user-defined time frame. And then, of course, we use the minimal inhibitory concentration, MIC patterns for combinations of microorganisms and uh, antibiotics. So that also is done. Then, of course, the laboratory helps in, the, in determining the antimicrobial susceptibility trends. So we can determine the trends of antimicrobial susceptibility in various areas, even in various geographic areas, so that we can know which uh, antibiotics are susceptible, which are uh, inhibitory, uh, so that we will know the pattern of medicines or antibiotics to use in various areas, even across the country. Then early recognition of an unusual agent introduced uh, bio, bio terror, uh, bioterrorists. So bioterrorism. Here I'm talking about biosafety, biosecurity. So laboratory is very important when we want to talk about biosecurity, where even the organisms, the dangerous organisms uh, can come out and uh, be used for bioterrorism. Uh, so uh, once I have a lot of questions to answer, I'll reserve most of uh, my uh, presentations to the questions and answer time. So in conclusion, to overcome M AMR or antimicrobial resistance, the one half uh, approach is very crucial. It's indeed very necessary. Uh, where the, the veterinary, the environment, the laboratory itself, and the research, all of uh, animal health and uh, human health, you know most of our diseases when they come, they come as zoonotic infections. Uh, from animal to human beings. So very important, we have to uh, embrace the one health uh, uh, approach, which WHO is telling us to do. Uh, so that will also go a long way to help protect the environment from micro leakage, from leakage of microorganisms. Then it will also help to reduce the use of antimicrobial agents in animal crop farming uh, and improve veterinary hospitals. And then, of course, it will also go a long way to help produce quality drugs, diagnosis, uh, diagnose the right micro, prescribe the right drug, and take the right dose at the right time. So on this note, I want to say that the one health approach, environment, animal, and human is very necessary. I would like to end here with my presentation so that when it comes to the uh, various questions, I, I will go into details, of course, how some of the even laboratory investigations are done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much, uh, Dr. William Adomels. And as you said, there are going to be several questions and I want to thank all the facilitators for their first inputs. So I'm going to ask questions based on what we've already discussed and, and also target specific facilitators based on their expertise. And I want to direct my first question to Dr. William Addo because it's to do with labs. Um, I really like the way you, you mentioned the meaningful dissemination of results um, to the doctors from the lab, it's very important that they are able to interpret it and know what to do from there. But can you tell us a bit more, what are the processes in detecting antimicrobial resistance microorganisms? So how do you go around this? If you can tell us briefly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, 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 this thing is very, uh, this, but I hope, uh, 
uh, I, I've gotten you right. Uh, how do we detect antimicrobial resistant microorganisms? Uh, of course, uh, we detect antimicrobial micro, uh, uh, resistant microorganisms in different uh, ways in the laboratory. Uh, so I'll give a few examples of ways we uh, detect. Uh, we use a disk diffusion. We use a disk diffusion uh, uh, method. For example, the European Community of Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, we call EUCAS method, uh, is used. We also mm -hmm. use the agar disk diffusion method. We use the antimicrobial gradient method. We call it E-test. So that also can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, other diffusion methods include uh, agar well diffusion method, agar plug diffusion method, cross street method where we stick the uh, organisms in the plate and then we put the antimicrobial agents on it to mm -hmm. check for the susceptibility uh, testing. Then we, of course, sometimes may also use poison food method, uh, mm -hmm. but that is not very common. The most common one is the agar well diff diffusion method and the other methods I've mentioned. Uh, a, a broth dilution, agar dilution, uh, can be done so that we can also get uh, the serial dilutions and get uh, uh, the actual uh, concentration of uh, uh, antimicrobial agent uh, of antimicrobial antibiotics which uh, the agent can react to. Uh, so this is what uh, I can say for now. Of course, we have the thin layer chromatography, uh, biotography. Uh, tests we can do uh, direct biotography tests, EGA uh, overlay biosay, other methods, time kill test method. Uh, we can draw a time kill curve, uh, curve and then uh, ATP bioluminescence assay, flow cytometric uh, method also can be used. Uh, so this is what I can say for now uh, for the methods used. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for the education. Um, so I, I want to move on to my next question. Um, having learned a bit more from here, how we are able to detect antimicrobial resistance. Um, in our experience, so I'm directing this question to Dr. Sifra. Why do we think antimicrobial resistance is, is on the increase? And as within your institution, what other measures beyond what you already told us are being put in place to somehow minimize this? Thank hello, you Dr. very Sita. much. Um, so, the, hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So yes. the major drivers of antimicrobial resistance um, has to do with overuse of antimicrobials and misuse of antimicrobials in the human sector. Um, in addition to misuse and overuse, there is also the fact that there is low vaccination coverage, um, especially in our setting, low middle income countries, where there is poor water sanitation and hygiene increasing infection levels and therefore if you are having issues of low vaccination coverage then you have high levels of infection and therefore the population will be dependent on the use of antibiotics which would then for drive the increase in antibiotic use um, but on the issue of misuse of antibiotics generally we put them under either unnecessary use or inappropriate use when we say unnecessary use of antibiotics in the human population, we are talking about where an antimicrobial is not indicated and also where there is no health benefit for the patient, but antibiotics or antimicrobials are being used. So for instance, the treatment of upper respiratory tract infections caused by virus um, where we have not been able to identify that um, the causative organism is bacteria, but we are using antibiotics 
is an unnecessary use and that can drive antimicrobial resistance. When we talk about inappropriate use, um, we are talking about um, where antimicrobials are being used in terms of its poor timing or the choice of antimicrobials that have been selected for the infection is poor. So for instance, you are choosing a broad spectrum instead of a narrow spectrum or the dose is either high or low. The route of administration um, is poor, the frequency duration. These are what comes under what we've referred to as inappropriate use of antibiotics. And um, there are various strategies that can be used to either deal with unnecessary use of antimicrobials or inappropriate use of antimicrobials. For instance, with unnecessary use, we would have to increase the need for rapid diagnostic tests to mm -hmm. um, supplement the culture and sensitivity testing, which in our settings here takes a lot of days before we are able to tell exactly what type of organism we are dealing with and mm -hmm. which antimicrobial is most effective. Um, so if you have rapid diagnostic test kits, for, for instance, for upper respiratory tract infections, um, which happens to be one of the commonest infections in our setting, it would um, reduce unnecessary use. Inappropriate use would also be dealt with if um, prescribers and clinicians and all users of antimicrobials um, are educated on guideline compliance, especially where there is a need for empirical management, where you are not testing the type of organism, but clinical signs and symptoms show that you are dealing with, for instance, a bacterial infection, and we know the most likely organism. There is therefore the need to tailor um, our treatment towards the most common organism and the most effective antimicrobials at the right dose, at the right route, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the ways of dealing with the drivers of um, antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your response. And I want to tie in your response to the next question, which deals with hospital acquired infection. And uh, this is will you talk a little about uh, hospital acquired infection and the infection prevention control. Um, that um, is being implemented in these hospitals. So um, this question is to you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Philomena. What would you say are the main drivers when it comes to hospital-acquired infection? And how is this leading on to antimicrobial resistance? So I would say that the main drivers are that we usually don't take precaution about the use of our PPEs. Mm -hmm. And so we are not able to break the chain of infection from one patient to the other. And I would say that, mm -hmm. for instance, in dressing of wound, we are supposed to segregate the wounds from sterile wounds, from contaminated wounds, so that when you are dressing, you group the sterile ones and dress them first before you move to the contaminated ones. And also decontamination of our instruments. Sometimes we do not do it properly as it's supposed to be and sterilization as well. And then staff using of appropriate PPEs. Sometimes we don't use them well. So especially face masks, gloves, and then towels, hand towels and the rest. Sometimes we don't use them well. And even taking of vital signs. Sometimes we move from one patient to the other without taking precautionary measures of cleaning it properly. And hand hygiene. Health personnel moves from one 
clients or patients to the other. Sometimes we don't wash our hands properly and even wash it at all. And so these are some of the issues that brings about hospital acquired infections. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your response. Um, I want us to move away from the hospital and into the community, so outside of the hospital settings. Um, and this question is um, directed to Dr. Amufa, because in your submission, you also talked about some work that you're also doing in the community and being able to collaborate with other um, stakeholders. I want you to tell us a little about what would you think um, each member of the health team um, can do to prevent the development of antimicrobial resistance within the community? Hello, Dr. Amofa. If you can hear me, it, it's so so yes yes i i can hear you now the the, really? the line is a little bad uh it, it, yeah to, to to prevent it in, in the healthcare setting or in the community in the community yeah in the community okay good that, that, that thank you very much the the uh, pre preventing uh antimicrobial resistance in the community is actually linked to what happens in the in the health facility because people learn a lot from what they see and observe when they come to hospitals. In, in the community, why will people misuse uh, antibodies? One is because um, pre prescribers themselves may falsely uh, pre 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 prescribe um, antibodies inappropriately. I mean, and, and so the pre 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 patients the, the themselves they then learn from it because I've seen quite a, a number of nurses and other uh, clinicians who will uh, take drugs from their bar from their bags and and actually give to uh, people and 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 if you do that, they, they, they then for obvious reason without prescription, you they, they then uh, create that uh, mm -hmm. atmosphere of uh, misuse of antibodies. The second thing we can do, apart from public education on the side effects of uh, misuse of antibiotics, is, is the fact that we have to insist on community pharmacies, those, those who are in the community, not mm -hmm. to prescribe antibiotics to any or dispense uh, antibiotics to anybody without a, 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 a prescription form. What, what we are observing is that because people uh, will say that, well, if I don't prescribe uh, or dispense, then the, the, the patient will go to another place uh, for, for the same uh, thing uh, and purely for economic reasons may, may go beyond what they, they, they are uh, re re recommending. The other aspects of, um, well, ed education is that people know that the, the mere fact that you are sometimes and science have gone. Uh, and I think uh, one of the facilitators mentioned that. It does mm -hmm. not mean that you are well. Uh, and, and the more you misuse uh, an antibiotic, then it may happen that at a time of great need, mm -hmm. when you actually need a particular type of uh, antibiotic, that, that then it will be resistant. And, and so basically educating uh, the, the public for them to know the consequences of misuse of antibiotic, inappropriate use, and, and, and the like. And, and also uh, creating a, a system uh, around the hospital uh, for, for, for it to serve as a model uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so that people will learn the, the good habits uh, from the, 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 the health caregivers uh, as they attend uh, for, for, uh, facilities, yes, for, for various services. In the days, and and a few others where they, they definitely will be, be of importance uh, in um, curbing the uh, rise of antimicrobial uh, resistance. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for your response. Um, I, I want us to go back 
to the theme for the Antimicrobial Resistance Week, which is preventing antimicrobial resistance together. So the idea of working together, collaboration. So the next set of questions is going to look at how do we collaborate and work together as a team? So I want to direct my next question to Dr. Adomels. Um, in your experience, what are some of the factors that affect our ability as health professionals to work together? Hello, Dr. William. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, okay. Dr. William Ado, if you can hear me. Okay, so whilst we wait for him to respond, I want to move on to the next question and direct this to Mrs. Uh, Philomena. I, I want you to, based on your rich experience, tell us a bit more um, about the different components that you see that facilitates us all health professionals working together. Yes. Okay. I uh, thank you very much. Communication, proper communication is very important to bring us together as mm -hmm. as a team and also documentation. If we document the facts and then the findings and our research, if we are able to document them, we will come out as a team to fight against these antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. And then also we need to respect each other's opinion Whatever they bring together, we should look at it and respect them. And I, I also think that when we do that, we will be able to combat it. I think these are some of the things that I think when we put them together, we will be able to do that. And also putting a policy together so mm -hmm. that, and putting the policy together, I also think that all of the team should come together so that they will all own it. When they own it, each member of the team will be able to, to, to accept it and use it as a document to prevent the antimicrobials. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response. I, I, I want us to um look at it also in a different view so this i'm addressing to dr sefa um you undertook um, research where you brought uh, different stakeholders you mentioned you had pharmacists on the team a medical doctor you have a lab uh, scientist on the team what are some of the the lessons that you can share with us in terms of your ability to work together on this research, um, data collection, and how you were able to use the findings to inform practice at your hospital setting. Yeah, Augustina, can you kindly repeat the question? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was saying that you, you shared with us the rich experience of being able to collaborate on a research where you had pharmacists, lab scientists, nurses, and administrators, all being part of the team. So I, I want you to share with us some lessons and how you were able to collaborate in, in data collection and how the findings has been used within your settings. If you can share that with us. Okay, thank you.
very much, Augustina. Um, as you just said, um, collaboration has to do with different professional groups working together to positively impact healthcare. Um, in the hospital setting, um, even though we are supposed to work together collaboratively, there is still um, barriers and that barriers do not allow a certain kind of relationship that must exist. And we the, the, these barriers existed when we started the antimicrobial stewardship in these two facilities I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that some of the reasons why we, we have some of these barriers is because we saw it during the implementation of the stewardship, for instance, issues of lack of clarity regarding um, the rules and responsibilities of the individual professionals. Um, sometimes there's a feeling that um, you are stepping into somebody's territory. Um, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be independent in my field. And so mm -hmm. you are asking too many questions about how I went about with my diagnosis and so on. So mm -hmm. that lack of clarity regarding the rules and responsibilities that each one of us are supposed to play can affect or can be a barrier. Another important thing is um, mutual recognition. Mm -hmm. um, in, each, um, in each professions, how, what they can bring into the team. So the pharmacist recognizing that the role of the doctor is very important. The doctor recognizing that the microbiologist is very important. And that mutual recognition that if this person or this team member is not there, um, I can't do it alone is something that um, we realized that as we went on and we were able to um, cause each member to recognize, it helped. It helped so that it was easier for the, the doctor to quickly call the pharmacist to come and assist in um, coming out with the choice of antibiotics. These are my um, susceptibility test results mm -hmm. and these are the resistant ones. What do you think we should do? Um, what those do we think are appropriate? How do we go about in ensuring that there is a good pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic um, choice that will ensure that um, there's an optimum outcome? So that kind of you know, mutual recognition. And also one important thing, which has probably already been said, is good communication. Mm -hmm. um, you have something to say, but how do you communicate it in such a way that the other member of the team will not feel undermined and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, so these are some of the things that came up and um, as we worked together, as we were able to overcome some of these barriers helped us, in able, uh, helped us to be able to um, achieve what we have achieved so far, even though there's still a lot to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response and teamwork, communication, respect. Um, having clear roles and responsibilities. Um, these roles and responsibilities, in a way, overlap. Um, and then I'm sure because of these overlaps, uh, sometimes you find this tough war that you, you mentioned earlier on. So we have Dr. William, um, Ado William Paco back. And I want to ask him similar questions. In his experience, how can we promote um, collaboration so collaboration in terms especially within the lab setting how have you been able based on your experience to collaborate with other health professionals what lessons can you share with us okay thank you very much uh, yes I, I want to say here that interprofessional uh, collaboration requires a variety of skills and experiences. And the factors that can affect it include, uh, as my brother said, we, we need the rules and the, the structures. But here, I can say organization structure, organizational structure is very crucial. Then the leadership skills is, uh, is very crucial. Philosophy, of course, resources is very crucial. Then uh, administrative support. Uh, is 
also hello so we have lost dr uh, adomils again um, so whilst we wait for him to get back, um, I, I, I want us to start uh, wrapping up. But before we do that, I, I want us to have a moment where we all think about what would be the most essential attribute that you will give to the dream team, um, a, a healthcare team. So we've talked about respect, we've talked about communication. What attributes, in your opinion, based on your experience, would you say will result in a dream team? So we can start with um, Dr. Sefa, if you are online and your internet is very kind to you. If not, um, we okay. Madam Rector. Oh, okay. Hello. Yes, so the dream attributes of a dream healthcare team. Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. as I've already mentioned, I think that um, my dream mm -hmm. or what I'm considering will be our total dream will be mm -hmm. that we have a collaborative team, um, antimicrobial stewardship, which um, it's help is one of the ways of um, achieving antimicrobial resistance and, and being able to combat antimicrobial resistance require teamwork, absolute teamwork, and that teamwork can only be achieved if. Um, there is, as I've mentioned, there is trust, there is respect, we recognize each other, and we work together to achieve good patient outcome and also being able to drive this um, public health menace antimicrobial resistance. That is my dream healthcare team as far as antimicrobial resistance is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sipa. Um, Dr. Amofa, um, the same question, what would be your most essential attribute of a dream team to fight the menace of antimicrobial resistance? In, in 10 seconds, I mean, the most important is, uh, aspect will be a shared vision and, and objectives. If the whole institution that don't have that common shared vision, then you, the, the, there will be a, a, a failure. Mm -hmm. there, there might be buy-in of management of the in, uh, institution or the uh, yeah the, 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 the team, and then mm -hmm. accountability uh, to all. In other words, each member, each team uh, is accountable to each other. And the last one will be the respect for uh, for all with different rules and re re responsibilities, re recognizing the important roles of each player. Do, do, those are four key things uh, I, I can list. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mofa. Mrs. Uh, Molly, your most essential attributes of the dream team. Talk about three things. One, every team member should bring his or her optimum best in the fight against the resistance. And then breaking down the barriers that exist among the various professional groups. And also finally, absolute respect of the rules and opinions of the various team members in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. I think that is what I would want to leave here. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just checking if Dr. Mills is back. Dr. Mills is back. Um, 
if not, then we can wrap up. So it's been very, very educative, informative discussions and key words for me keeps going back to the collaboration. It keeps going back to um, shared vision that was mentioned, shared objective, being accountable to each other, respect. Uh, we keep going back with respect, trust, being able to communicate. Um, how do we even say things that we want to say such that we don't offend each other? And I, I, we all will agree that it's very important that we all work together as we try to fight um, antimicrobial resistance. So on that note, I want to hand over to Madam Rector for her closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Kodia. But I think we had okay. um, a question from a, a speaker, if yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh. Um. All right. So, so I, I let me help you. It says oh, do two so times. All right. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> yeah. So this is to Dr. Amofa. Could you please share some light on how the delayed prescription forms work? When you talked about the upper tract infection. Hello, Dr. Amofa. Okay, so whilst we wait for Dr. Amofa to respond to this question, if there are any other... Okay, so we have another question. Are there any publications from the police hospital? Oh, and then based on your research so and kata municipal project that we can access and um, so dr sefa if you can share the link to these publications if they are open access if you can share the link Yes, Augustine, I can I can share on the on the chat for some of the publications that we have had. Okay. Okay. That would be very great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um Dr. Amofa, please are you back online? Okay. So whilst we yes, Dr. Amofa is back. So there's a question on if you can tell us a little more about the delayed prescription, when you talked about the upper tract infection, how does it work? Uh, uh, yes, so, uh, thank you very much. They, uh, I think it came up when they were recognizing that a lot of the pre prescriptions that are given for upper respiratory tract infection in children mm -hmm. are actually not <clears throat> necessary and mm -hmm. uh, and so that there can be a, a system to 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 address that some uh, is based on the uk partners uh, experience even though it, it was a, a model thing they tested at legma hospital which has now been institutionalized i mean i must confess uh, some nurses have been trained uh, who will first screen or uh, children with symptoms signs and symptoms of um, mild uh, upper respiratory tract infection uh, be, before referring them they will categorize them into whether it's severe or, or, or this or that and 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 based on that they will re refer to particular pre pre prescribers who are also a uh, part of the team the, 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 if there's an indication of uh, uh, le, 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 let's say in, in, infection requiring uh, antibiotic they they may prescribe it hold it at the pharmacy for uh, for for some time while the 
use the non-medical advice for them. The nurse will be in touch with the uh, patient uh, for 24, uh, 72 hours uh, and with the recognition that they can always come back to the facility and, and, and because the link is already established, if there's a need to give the prescription out, that then they will do, 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 do that. In fact, since they started, mm. uh, apart from one or two uh, patients who, who, who have actually had to come back because there was an actual need, uh, mm. <clears throat> the mo mo most of them, almost about 95% plus of, of all the patients, uh, no, 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 normally don't, don't uh, come back, even though they are followed up with to, to their homes uh, by the uh, nurses. And, and so it's, it's a system that basically cuts off quite a lot of unnecessary uh, pre -pre prescription. If there's a need for the pre prescription, the, the, the patient will come back and who, who, who will not be in the queue, will go directly to the pharmacy and they, they they will be able to sort sort, sort them out, yeah, and, and that is something that is now it has actually also been uh, pop, pop, pop. Um, hello, Dr. Amofa. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm the only one who cannot hear Dr. Amofa. Um, Okay, so I think the internet is not being fair to us this evening. So, but we had almost everything getting to the end. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mufa, for your insights on this. Um, Dr. Sifa has shared the link uh, to the publications that he talked about. So this will be made accessible to us so we can click on and, and, and read them and the lessons we can implement within our settings. Okay. So on this note, I want to hand over to Madam Rector um, for closing remarks. Thank you for a wonderful job done, Dr. Augustina Kodria. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. I believe that everybody here will agree with me that this has been great. It is clear that with collaboration, we will go very far. And perhaps our time here will mean increased collaboration amongst all of us healthcare workers and therefore greater success in this fight. Our panel has really delved into our various roles and also emphasized various points of collaboration. And I think the discussions have brought out the fact that we all play very important roles. I also realized that one particular cadre of professional may not understand clearly what other professionals are doing in this fight. And that means that there is the need to collaborate, to understand what we are all doing and build on our strengths together. I believe one thing that has also come out strongly is collaborating in antimicrobial stewardship. And so we are sharing with you a link on which we can apply for a grant to be part of the CW Palms program which is managed by FET. This will help us establish stewardship programs in our facilities if we don't already have them in place. And the questions really brought out some interesting details. So this has been very, very educative, but we must not forget the attention that Dr. Mills Papo was trying to draw our minds to get our attention to one health. There is a need for us to look at animal health, the environment, and our food. So now having said all of that, all that is left 
is for me to say thank you to our panel of experts. You have exposed to us great insights on how we can collaborate and bring out the best results. And thank you to all our participants. Let's remember that we have to collaborate in this fight against the development of antimicrobial resistance. One group cannot do it alone. And our final thanks go to the almighty God for making this meeting possible. Now to our call for action. Let's commit ourselves to work together to, pre to prevent antimicrobial resistance together. And with that, I will say a good night to us all and God bless us all. Good night. Yeah.